gazelle. But there's a herd of both Thompson's gazelle and Grant's gazelle that she's keeping a very beady eye on. And when we found her, we were actually on the other side of those belts of green bushes behind her and she made her way towards these individuals. So she looks hungry and I think she's just planning her attack right now. We've got ourselves into a very, very fortunate position here. And I'm very excited to see what turns out. At the moment, as you can see, that Grant's gazelle has got no idea that there is a cheetah keeping a beady eye on him. And we've just got a glimpse. Oof, there's some Thompson's gazelle on the right that are walking straight towards her, go more to the right. And now you can see she's in full stalk mode, and the reason why is because the Thompson's gazelle are heading towards her. And that is probably better suited prey for her. Ooh, this is going to be good. I'm thinking of possibly just repositioning the vehicle. No, we're actually okay. Looks like the Thompson's Gazelle are actually going to walk into the shot now. Here we go. Perfect. How exciting is this? Hello everyone who has just joined us on Facebook. As you can see, there is a cheetah in your screen and she is stalking up to a herd of unsuspecting Thompson's gazelle. There's some Thompson's gazelle as well as Grant's gazelle, both of which are suitable for her. These are two Tommies. And we are coming to you live from the Masai Mara in Kenya. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning here. And you can see she's just flattened herself down in the grass there. Often what predators will do is they will, rather than trying to creep up on their prey, if their prey is moving about, they'll sometimes wait for their prey to actually walk closer towards them. And that could well happen. Sadly, these guinea fowl, the little birds in the front of the shot, are not going to be suitable prey for her. But she's definitely looking nice and focused and just showing that she is experienced and using her patience rather than coming charging in. Colleen, good to have you with us. You say she stalks just like your house cat and I'm glad you've got a resemblance between the cheetah of Africa and your domestic cat wherever you are in the world. Let's keep an eye on the Tommies now, still completely unsuspecting. Looks like a mother and a youngster, not a very small youngster. And the fact that there's only two of them in this immediate area now is actually going to help the cheetah less eyes and ears to spot her approach. The more prey items there are, the more chance she has of being detected. Now what we do need to be worried about is if these guinea fowl catch wind of her, they will let off an almighty alarm call, which will put all the antelope into a bit of a frenzy, searching for a predator. Oof. This Thompson's eyed gazelle has got no idea who's spying on it. Yes, Colleen, the reason why the guinea fowl aren't making a noise yet is because they can't see her. And what we need to remember is that the camera that we're filming off is elevated. It's about a meter and a half off the ground. The guinea fowl's head is only 20 centimeters off the ground. So they're going to have to get a lot closer to her before they see her. But if they continue, you can see she's trying to flatten herself to avoid being seen by then. 
The Thompson's gazelle are getting closer and closer to her. Hi, Becca, you'd like to know how often do cheetah need to eat? Roughly every 24 to 36 hours is what I've noticed with the Musketeer Coalition. But they'll easily be able to survive three days without having a meal once they have, in fact, filled their bellies. Now, be ready, guys. She could explode at any moment. It's difficult to know and judge exactly how far away she is from this Thompson's Gazelle at the moment. We get a bit of a compressed shot at this angle. So it may appear that the Tommies are a little bit closer, or actually a little bit closer than they really are in real life. They may be a little bit further away than it appears. Please, may these guinea fowl not spot her. You can see she's completely disappeared now, trying to avoid being seen by the guinea fowl. It'll be such a tragedy if they give her a, her position away. Oh, this Tommy is now continuing straight towards her at quite a speed. It seems like that guinea fowl must be almost on top of the cheetah at the moment. Oof, Tommies. You guys are in trouble. Hi, Cammy, you'd like to know if these are adult Tommies. And yes, these both look like adult females. One of which is a is a little bit smaller. Maybe not. Maybe she's a sub adult. Be ready at any moment, guys. This is she's going to explode now. Surely, surely she's going to burst out after one of them. They're about to step on her. I, you can just see her head moving slightly. She's in between the four of them. Directly in between the four of them now. I think that smallest one on the right is the one that she's going to go for. And we can expect, surely she's going to have to make a move soon. They almost appear to be standing on top of where she was. But again, maybe it was the compressed shot that we were getting that is confusing us. You can literally see the cheetah there, a little white speck just to the left. Oh, there's a cheetah's head. Here we go. Is she going to catch up to them? She's singled off the youngster. No, it looks like she's given up. Oh. Well. Well done, Tommies. You guys did very well to escape that. Whew. Well. Actually, on closer inspection, it appears like she's not as hungry as I thought she was. She's got quite a belly on her. So maybe that was just an opportunistic hunt. It's not that she's starving. Because her belly did seem quite well fed. I'm told a few of you are possibly wondering if she is pregnant. And she could be. It's very difficult to distinguish between a belly full of Thompson's gazelle or a belly full of baby cheetah. At least for me it is. And there is a chance she could be pregnant. I'm not sure which female cheetah this is. We will be able to work it out with some of your guys' help. Once we get closer, we can get you some good shots of her that you can use to try and ID her. But yes, she could well be a pregnant female. I do remember there was a report of a cheetah in this area yesterday that did make a kill. And I'm guessing it may have been her because her belly did seem to be quite full. My name's Scott, good to have you on board, all of you who joined us just for the live action broadcast on Facebook. We are going to be saying goodbye to all of you if you'd like to continue watching the safari and this cheetah, wildsafarilive.com is the best way to do that. Otherwise, keep tuned in to the notifications, who knows, maybe she'll have another go at some Tommies later, or we may find some cheetah who are a little bit more hungry and a little bit more effective hunters. Thanks for joining, see you next time. Jumbo Bona.
Kweli. Unaona mali nilikuwa na wata mtu alafu unapita juu. Aha. Ukaona mimi nikafuka hivi nikaenda hivi. Aha. Wako na huko mbele kabisa. Mali ngombe wanapita. Aha. Na unatembea ama unala? Ameshiba? Hawaja, hawaja kula. Kama wanatafuta kitu ya kula. Okay. Okay, hiyo habari mzuri bwana. Asante sana. Hello everyone, I've just been chatting with a guide who has provided us with some wonderful information on the Musketeer Coalition. So that is where we are going to be heading off to. It's quite away from here and we're going to send you across to Taylor who's also found some predators. Good cheetah hunt, bro. Hey, that was good. Look at what we've got. Remember how we were talking about finding lions on a lugger laying about? We did actually just after when you um, you left us. I turned my head and looked to the left, and there they were. That's all I had to do. But we had to go quite a long way around to try and find these cats. Oh, old, the scenic way around. There wasn't a, really a direct route, but that's just, I suppose, okay. But now, I don't know if it's the Happy Valley pride that Brent often talks about because there, there are about three or four lionesses with about a million cubs. Not really a million cubs, I like to exaggerate, but a lot of cubs. About nine or ten of them. Maybe, maybe a little bit less. I don't have my big notebook here because I was talking about trees yesterday and then I was making lots of notes on trees and I left that at home. But we've got four adult lionesses. And then I think there's two sub-adult males here too. There must be about just over a year, just under a year and a half or so. And that seems to be it. So it could be one of the Purungat prides, whether it's the actual Purungat pride or the Purungat, the Purungat breakaway pride. It could be them too. I'm not exactly sure, but there are lions and I'm very happy to see them, which is quite cool because there's some sign of life in this area. We didn't have to go uh, looking too far for any animals which is nice now they don't seem to be starving they're well fed they've got relatively large bellies and I'm wondering if they're going to get up and move now and find a shady spot I think they've been laying here for most of the morning and now that the the Sun is starting to peep through the clouds and it is getting warm Jar just took his jacket off I'm just taking my scarf off now too uh, they're going to have to find a decent spot for shade. And where they're sitting right now, oh, there's bits and pieces. I suspect that they might head down to the lugger where it'll be nice and cool. There's quite a few big trees. So we might get some cats on the move. Uh, there have been plenty of animals passing by, but they haven't really showed any interest in them this morning. Lots of topi. There were lots of zebra, but they have booked it and head over uh, the top of the horizon. But we'll sit here with these cats and hopefully they wake up in the next few minutes. Let's jump back across to South Africa with a beautiful kingfisher. We have a woodland kingfisher. I'm trying not to speak too loud. I don't want to scare him off. So exciting. What's the date today, Jandre? The 12th, maybe. Something like that. Okay, so it's the 12th of November, I think. And it's our first woodlands. Thank you, Kirst. It is the 12th. Fabulous. I don't know if anyone guessed that. We were chatting about it this morning. I know that uh, James was also chatting about it this morning, about when would they come. I think my comment was after the first big rains. We did have some nice rain yesterday. So he snuck in here. I say he could be a she. No sexual dimorphism, no difference between the male and the female. Fabulous. So let's have a look. Top beak is red. Bottom beak is black little bit of a grayish color on the top of the head but not as gray as a gray-headed kingfisher um, and then that blue blue that azure blue that turquoise blue on the black on the back absolutely gorgeous so summer is well and truly here I saw carmine bee eaters the other day in Shlubukani Viewers, you're excited. I'm also excited. It was Jandre who spotted this little butte, so we have to give um, thumbs up and hand claps to Jandre. And he's been very nice and wanting to be on camera for a very long time. Oh, and then 
there he's off fantastic so we <laughs> jinxed us a little bit but there we are everyone our first woodlands kingfisher thank you jandre high five thanks jandre all right so our wild <laughs> our wild dog hunt is mm, yes they are doing what dogs do and moving around we did finally see some of our own tracks and they're moving in this direction I have a feeling that what's been happening this morning is the tracks that we've been picking up have been from different points uh, and I will agree Rexon says they're about three hours ago and I definitely agree with him on this and they've just been moving in this circle Rexon's convinced that they've already made it into the Kruger National Park I am still holding out hope so what we're actually going to be doing is moving back in the general area where we left our lion tracks because that's the sort of way that they're moving but again it's not like a lion it's not like a leopard it's not straight through so we're not racing anywhere anymore we are pushing and we're pushing little bit by little bit and then I could see before where they had chased around some wildebeest but hadn't been successful um, so they are definitely on the hunt so I'm hoping that they didn't go into the KMP I'm hoping that they're still here and by KMP I mean Kruger National Park um, and we're going to keep trying that. So while we're busy still with our wild dogs, we're going to head back up to Taylor, who has lions for you, up in Kenya, and see what they are up to. That cheeky little lazy lion pride. Very cool that you got the first woodland kingfisher on screen. Well done, Noel. You win the award, but did you win the bet? Who won the bet this year about who guessed right? Now, Anyways, let's, let's get down to business. I cannot bake. I can cook really well, actually, but I cannot bake. I burn water when I bake for some bizarre reason. I think it's because I don't like to follow instructions. And anyways, I made something that involved no baking. It's my, tr my childhood treat that my mom used to make me all the time, and they're delicious. So she called them chocolate crackles. It's basically... I'm listening. Ah, VM was a close. He said the 10th of November for the Woodland Kingfisher. Well done, wildebeest. And um, anyway, so it's basically chocolate, a bit of peanut butter, and then puffed rice cereal, essentially. It's delicious. No baking involved. They're so tasty. And I just sent my mum a message actually saying, Mum, why was I never treated to chocolate crackles and lions at the same time? I find that... Very disturbing, considering that we went on safari so often and they would have made the perfect snack. But then I think to myself, maybe it's because I would have been bouncing up and down on the car seats if she'd given me any chocolate or any sweets while going on safari. My poor parents having to be stuck in the car with me and my brother, my younger brother. Uh, but yes, but our lines are here. They're starting to wake up slowly. Well, they could just be teasing us. They're grooming slightly. But we do know that lions do this sometimes where they'll groom themselves and then they'll do big yawns and you think, right, they're getting up, they're going to move, and then they just go back to sleep again. So they can be a bit disappointing. But hopefully they won't be disappointing today. I would like it if they would go and stroll along uh, towards the lugger because maybe they flush something else. Maybe a little antelope or who knows, a warthog. Something could be around there. Even a big buffalo just laying in the mud because it's warm enough for them to lay in the mud. And the, the girls are definitely... Definitely, uh, they look like they're going to wake up. I'm hoping that this is going to be the case. They're strong lions, though. They are so powerful. Their chests are so much, in my opinion, they're so much wider, so much more stockier than the lions in the Sabi sand. I wonder if it's just because they're traveling huge distances, especially when there isn't any food around. They have to move out of their comfort zones in, in search of something to eat. Oh, now that's a nice scene. It's one of why they're such successful cats is because, of course, they're so social. And when you live in a family like this, it is important that you constantly groom one another. Or oh, she didn't like that. <laughs> what did you get? Did you get a tick in the mouth or something that you didn't quite like that didn't taste very nice? One laying down is looking back going, carry on, please. I'm not finished just yet. Please, can you continue licking my ears? I can't reach them. But it just always amazes me how we can arrive in lion sightings majority of the time. And they just don't even care about us. I mean, obviously if you drive on top of them, they're going to care about you and probably run away. But if you just keep a good distance from them, most of the time they don't even open their eyes as you're trying to reposition the car. to 
B. Right, everybody, we are live and we've got something quite spectacular to show you. Unfortunately, we were a little bit slow in realizing what was going on. I don't, well, no, that's not actually true. It's quite thick. Come over here. We're just going to give you a quick view of what we found. Very exciting news. Rexon displayed exceptional skills, but there's a kill on the ground there. And as we suspected, Shadow has collected her baby. She's made a kill here. I'm not going to get any closer to it than we are now. She's... Okay, she's charging. There she is. Come over here. She's not charging. She's just growling. <laughs> okay, there's the baby. Is that the mother or the baby? That's the mother. So she, she gave a big growl there. We didn't think she was here. We thought something had moved off. And it's quite possible the baby's moved off. Okay, let's move a little bit away. Let's give her some space. Come over here. Let's just give her some space. She's not... She's a little bit nervous. And she's also got a kill. Let's just move away. We'll come and stand on the road here, and then we'll call Noel in. Going, Rexon, you said you wanted to find a leopard on a kill today, and you have done so. Yeah. Let's just go over here. We're a nice distance away now. And let's just see if we can't spot her again. Do you want to call Noel, Rex? Okay. Rex says let's have ten minutes here first and let's see if we can't get another view. Alrighty. So that... It's the tree there. It's the one you can see lying down. The kill's in front of that tree there. Alright, let's just have a little bit of a recap. So we found the tracks going down towards Treehouse Dam, and then they turned around and came back again, both tracks. Now when that happens, you can be fairly certain that the mother has made a kill, and she's heading straight towards it, and they do head straight. It's the one of the easier times to track a leopard. It's not easy, but it's easier, because they walk in a dead straight line. We then came up here, lost the tracks every now and again, Rex and found them again, and as we found them again for the fourth time or so, he spotted the kill. She had obviously heard us coming. She'd got into that thick bush where we eventually saw her. I think there were a lot of alarm calling birds down towards the drainage line. And I think what happened was that the youngster probably moved off before she did. And she just crouched there and she just waited. And then because we moved around to show you the kill, she reacted, she growled and jumped over the bush and then waited for a while where we got that beautiful picture of her and then she slunk off into the thick bush. She's not going to go anywhere from there. All right, we're gonna sit here for another 10 minutes and see if we can't get a view. If we can't, then we'll bring Noel in here. I mean, we'll bring her in here anyway. But in the meantime, let's go back across to the Maasai Mara with Scott and his cheetah. As wonderful as the scene is of a female cheetah lying in this green open meadow surrounded by little white ink flare flowers, we are going to abandon her and thank her for her wonderful chase a little bit earlier, wish her luck for the rest of the day, and head off in the search of the Musketeer Coalition, who are apparently about a 20 minute drive from us and still on the move as we speak. So, We've got some ground to cover. Wondering what our best route is there. Hmm. So that's the good news. Hopefully we'll be lucky and either find them still on the move or sit patiently with them for the rest of the day until they decide to start moving again. Manu and I will be out the entire day. That's our plan. 
man. I just wish Taylor was across here to leave that female cheetah now. It's such a terrible feeling because there is a chance she could get up and continue to do some hunting. Anyway, something that we are learning for the future. It might be beneficial to have two vehicles across here more often than not because there are just so many cheetah around at the moment and they've been providing us with the most incredible moments during daylight hours which is something we really haven't had the benefits of being able to share with you guys much often like Sorry, everybody. I'm just discussing about the well, the group of lines that we've got here, uh, and also apologies for the gremlins this morning. So I made a mistake. There's not four adult lionesses. It's actually three adult lionesses, and then two sub-adult males and one sub-adult female. Too. She's just quite big. Now they are. They're moving to the shade, and I reckon they're probably going to hang around here. This lioness that's laying next to the car. Maybe you can bring up some screenshots because she's sitting quite flat now. Just looking at the others and they're walking past. Ja and I just discussed, I wonder if this female is not pregnant. And the reason why I say that is because as she got up and walked away, it looked like her mammary glands were starting to swell slightly. And her belly is bulging, well, a huge amount more than the other females. So I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if we could have little lions on the way. So hopefully over the next few weeks or so, we will try and follow this pride. They are very, very far away though. Uh, so it is going to be tough, but we can... We can always, of course, of course, try. But I think that could be quite cool. And I think there might be little ones around here. So I think that this is the one of the Purungat prides. Three adult females and three sub-adults, if I'm not mistaken. They're lovely cats, though. And like I said, they're beautiful lionesses. They're stunning. And uh, the two young sub-adult males are very attractive, too. You can see them just starting to get their fluffy manes now. Yeah, it's a big yawn. Isn't that cool? Now, there's a much shade here for them. They're going to have to tuck themselves right underneath this, these little shrubs. I think these are little crotons that are growing here. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Uh, they seem to pop up all over. I will try and find them on my little plant app that I managed to get. Do you know, are they little crotons? Yeah, there's so many different types of croton species throughout the whole of Africa. I'm not sure which ones they are, but I remember reading something, I think it was an orange-leafed croton, but I please don't quote me on anything like that. I will confirm 100% once I know, but they're all around here, and they do make for, oh, nice. and they do make for nice little shady pockets for lions or cheetah to sit in. And we're in exactly the same spot now that we last saw the, 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 the uh, border boys were here the last time, a few weeks back. Cheryl, you've actually said, well, you've heard Kirst say it, now you're hearing it twice. <laughs> you've said that you agree with me, and you think that that lioness is pregnant. I think so. Yeah, that's a, that's a big belly. But with cats, it's so difficult. I mean, one minute they look fine, look like they haven't eaten a meal, and then two weeks later, huge belly, and then all of a sudden they give birth. It's like what happened with Tandy. I mean, she looked heavily pregnant, and then all of a sudden, over a few days, and then the next minute, whew, gone, she's given birth. How exciting. So I reckon, it's hard to say though, I reckon in maybe three, two to three weeks' time, I think we'll maybe see some little cubs around here. It will be interesting to see if she starts to move off now and start searching for a den site. But we'll stay with these cats for a little bit longer. Maybe they wake up a bit more, move to some more shade. I'm going to send you back across the other side of the river. And Scott is on his way. He's looking for the musketeers. I certainly was, but I couldn't help but stop to show you this poor zebra. It's clearly had an attack of sorts, probably by a lion, and it's got that massive chunk of skin and flesh dangling off its left rump. You can also see how the scars on the right of its, uh, sorry, the stripes on the right of its tail don't match up properly. So it's had a proper, proper attack. Who knows whether it was by a crocodile crossing the river or lions, but this poor zebra is not in a good 
state. Having said that, doesn't seem too bothered by the injury, and it's always remarkable how strong these wild animals are and resilient when they do get injuries. Sure. Look at that. Good. Well, like I said, I couldn't resist stopping to show you that interesting scene. But we've got a long way to go to get out to the Musketeer Coalition. They're somewhere kind of out in that direction. I can't believe that uh, James managed to find shadow on foot and get a bit of an interesting situation unfold there. Exciting stuff and well done to him for making that all work out. Sounds like it's bush war. Lots of action and it's not over yet. heading a little bit more east than we are at the moment but we should be able to get a road up ahead the road network here is quite not tricky it's just hard to be certain where roads are actually going to take you because they often meander they don't go straight And so many of these areas all look the same. Should we go for it, Manu? Flying with the leopard faced vulture. Woohoo! Nice one. See you later, buddy. Happy hunting. <laughs> A moving flying shot. Camera's worst nightmare. Good, we're going to race you off. <laughs> to Taylor with her lions. Taylor and the lions. Yes, we're still here. Some of them are in the shade. Some of them are in the sun. What are they going to do next? I don't think they're going to get up to too much hunting this morning. I feel like the opportunities on Miss the Grass is very short. The zebra all knew they were here. The topi knew they were here. They might have to try a bit later, but they are in a good spot because they've found themselves a bit of shade, a bit of rock cover for, for little shrubs. And if something comes over the top of the crest of the hill behind them, they're going to have absolutely no idea that the lion's there unless the wind is blowing in their direction. Then, of course, they will smell them. But I think they might have a chance. There's normally plenty of warthog around here. And we know that there's lots of mothers with piglets at the moment or even just a big bull could be making his way down to the lugger to go and roll in a bit of mud or maybe even a lone buffalo and they would be in prime position or oh, zebra or anything really any animal coming past and they'll take that opportunity and I've noticed that that's what lions like to do is they just sort of sit and wait and hope that something walks upon and stumbles into them which happens actually quite often I've, in most of the times you know you see lions resting getting ready to settle in for the day and the next minute you come back in the afternoon and they're on a kill and I don't think, and not particularly far, just because an animal has literally walked straight into them. So I think there is some strategy about where they go and lie sometimes. Not all the time, just every now and then. And you can't see it, but if you see those lions lifting their heads and looking towards the sky every now and then, it's because there's some vultures that are trying to catch thermals around here. They also could have just put in flying over to see if the lions had anything. Now, Colleen, you're wondering if the... 
the size of a pride would depend on the size of an area um, most certainly and and not just that it, it would also mean what how much food is in the area is it good grazing so typically the size of a pride and then the size of their territory um, would also will depend on that type of thing so if you have an area that hasn't got particularly good grazing what's the point I mean you might only find one or two female lions laying about the odd male you won't find a huge pride of 20 odd lions but in an area that's good soil which then would bring about good grazing and would bring animals into the area of course then the prides can get quite big but if you are in a particularly bad area and we actually see this with the hyenas here and it's why hyenas sort of have massive ranges in comparison to the sabi sand is because certain spots they, there's just nothing you know they might be living on the edge of the escarpment which is not particularly great yes we see buffalo and things going down up and down and elephants using a giraffe going you know up towards the 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 treed areas and then back down in the mornings um but it's not great for smaller sort of games so they have to travel huge distances to try and find water although i feel like water is, is all around here in all the luggers there's always a little pan that hasn't quite dried up just yet uh, so uh, so definitely I think there's a lot of things uh, that would determine the size of a pride as well um, what, what we've noticed a lot here is the prides get so large and then you get these little breakaways where two or three females have gone you know we're not going to stay anymore we're going to group together and we're going to move off and we're going to form our own little pride and sometimes they go back to their maternal pride not always and when we find over the years they don't even see each other anymore and they just go their separate ways but it's just been really really interesting guiding in a completely new biome new area learning the different behaviors of the animals in Kenya and we most certainly have seen that that there's definitely a behavioral difference between the lions here and the lions in, in the Sabi sand and the greatest thing that I've noticed and I still cannot get over it to this day is the fact that the lionesses mark territories here it is unbelievable I, I'm really so flabbergasted about that and uh, I want to start asking other guides in South Africa if they've ever seen it. I've obviously only guided in the Eastern Cape and then up in the Sabi Sand uh, as my sort of guiding areas in South Africa. So there's, there's many other uh, habitat types throughout the whole of the country. So it'll be interesting to find out if any other South African guides have actually seen something like that and maybe just not in the areas that I've been. But you would think with the high density of, of lions in the Sabi sand, we would have seen behavior like that. But I have not. First time I've ever seen it. I didn't even really see it. I didn't see it in Zambia. Although I didn't see too many lions up in Zambia. I saw more leopards. Um, I think feline AIDS had gone through and unfortunately wiped a lot of the populations out in Lower Zambezi National Park. So they they were still trying to breed up again. Okay, I think we're going to say goodbye to these lions. They look like they're settling in for the day now, so we might see if we can find a cheetah perhaps under a tree. Noelle, however, has found herself a group of elephants. Hello, hello, hello. We have managed to come across a beautiful little breeding herd of Ellie's. Jandre has been the spotter of the day. It's been excellent. So they're just busy feeding and feeding quickly as it's cool and um, their body temperature is lower than usual because of this cool weather and so they're able to eat and move and eat and move when it's more warm they tend to be more slow in their movements and conserve their energy a little bit more I never get tired of watching them eat and how they utilize their trunk. They can, Penny. Penny, you're wondering if um, they'll stampede when scared. It depends on what has scared them and it also depends on if there's little ones with. So they can run off a lot of the times what you'll see is they'll actually circle um, amongst each other and put the little ones in the middle. Um, as you can see, there's a small one there, quite, quite a little one, tiny little one. Um, so put in the middle and then assess the situation and then from there decide if they're going to move off quickly or not. Um, so not quite as a stampede as you would see with, say, a wildebeest. Yes, that one is teeny tiny. It's having trouble moving about. Oh, 
<laughs> Sorry. When they're little like this, they quite haven't quite figured out how to how their body functions. <laughs> you get amazing moments like that. <laughs> I love it. Um, so so yeah, Penny. They'll they'll protect that one and the other small ones over anything else. Um, and when they stampede, it's not like a wildebeest or a buffalo herd where they all just sort of run in a group almost willy nilly. They do so with decisive action for the betterment of the herd in a direction that they feel is going to <laughs> is going to be the safest that they can. I'm sorry, we have to watch him for a little bit. He's too comical. So at this age, he can't use his trunk. So he's he's nursing but he wants to feed Obviously on some vegetation as well, so he used to get his, his face down. Viewers, I agree, this is uber cute. <laughs> and he'll get quite frustrated and bored quite easily as well. So he's re trying very hard to eat what mom eats, eat what aunties and cousins and everybody eats, but he his body can't function like theirs yet. So he's witnessing what they're doing, and he's busy working on those muscles, but it, it's going to take a while for him to get there. Nina, you're saying your favorite sound are elephant tummy rumbles, and have I heard any? this With this particular sighting right now, no. I haven't heard them rumbling at each other. They're extremely relaxed, and they're roundabouts. All the big females are roundabouts within eye contact of each other. But remember as well, they also communicate subsonically through infrasound through their feet. Um, so they're going to be communicating now uh, without us even being able to recognize it from the vehicle at least um, and the tummy rumbles have not occurred as of yet this is just an observation and it's not true for every sighting or for every herd but I've noticed when one especially the matriarch makes a decision about moving about where she wants to go or if some of the younger ones are being a bit out of line that's when you'll hear quite a few tummy rumbles um, basically she's she's using her loud voice to say hey listen let's move here or hey stop it um, other than that they they have a tendency to communicate on that infrasound level I also agree Nina it is an amazing sound it's also amazing because it's one of the sounds we can hear the trumpeting it's always nice but that tummy rumble is a is a I don't know if soothing is the right word but it is definitely a a, a bush sound that, that we all welcome. If this one flaps its ears again, you're going to see those veins nicely. Marley, who's five, you want to know how old that baby elephant was. Well, I would say a couple of months. Not more than six, but probably around two would be my guess. He's gone behind. This one's standing on the right-hand side of a termite mound. And that little one's gone behind the termite mound with mum up towards some of the, the other Ellie's. <laughs> This young male is very dexterously <laughs> climbing over this fallen down knob thorn. He um, he's looking for the 
little bits of green grass that have sprouted up uh, since we've gotten our bit of rain. Um, and so he's trying to maneuver his body into the best places to be able to get his trunk there so that he can, <laughs> he can pick them up. Elephants are very dexterous. Moving in places that sometimes we find it difficult to move in. <laughs> now he's resting his back foot on the branch behind. Here we go. One of their four limbs they tend to rest. He'll eventually, from what I can see, he'll eventually probably pull it over and then step over, but for now he's using that stump as a, as a good resting place. Now remember, elephants don't have four legs, they have two arms and two legs, so the joints at the back are a knee and an ankle. And when we get a good view, I'll try and show you the front where it's an elbow and a wrist. One, that's one of the reasons why they're so dexterous. Ooh, are you going to make it over? And there we go. <laughs> now he's going to rest that one. Can you hear the Franklins calling in the background? All right, now have a look at his front limb. See, so your elbow's at the back. When you put your arm straight, your elbow's at the back. Notice we can maybe, there's a little bit of brush in there. We'll see if he moves nicely for us. You'll be able to see that. It looks just like our elbow as well with all the crinkly little skin all the way around. There we go. And you see how it bends like an elbow, and then he's got a, a wrist in front there. Something interesting, Jandra, I don't know if you can catch his the tip of his trunk when he's busy pulling up the, um, the grass there. Um, elephants are either left tusked or right tusked, similar to how we're left handed or right handed. But I worked with an elephant researcher for a while and she was saying that the way that they move their trunk to collect either leaves or grass is also left handed or right handed. Our other fact for the day, we're doing lots of little facts today. Amanda from Alabama, you were wondering if elephants trumpet much at night. Um, elephants will trumpet when they're agitated or if the little ones, for instance, they really want to suckle for mum, they'll scream a little bit and then um, sometimes do a bit of a trumpet. It's not uh, nighttime or daytime dependent, it's uh, emotion dependent, it's mood dependent and situation dependent. Good question. At night, they can't see. Um, they have similar eyesight to us, so they're using their hearing and their sense of smell during the night, but also during the day they use it quite a bit as well. Um, but, but yeah, no, in general, it's just, just on their moods. This young male is being exceptionally kind to us. He's really found a good spot. So because that uh, dead knob thorn's there, you're having a lot of nutrients being put back into the soil, it's decomposing. Um, you've got a lot of the detrivores, so detrivor would be something like an earthworm or a cockroach or fungus and some bacteria is breaking everything down and creating a little nutrient uh, pool there, a little nutrient hotspot and the grass coming up, but also that as well, it's on the side of a termite mound which is also in and of itself a nutrient hotspot and a nutrient pool. So there's a lot of very palatable, very tasty grasses that will be sprouting up and he is taking advantage of every single one it looks like that's come up in the past two, three days. In the summertime, about 13%, roughly, 13% of their diet is grass. Oh, Jandre, can you see the female in the back? We've got a... Oh, she just stopped, but there's a... Um, looks like I'm having trouble seeing what kind of tree but um, she was trying to get the fruits off of it it might be a little balance
nighties tree a little torchwood I'll have to have a double check so she was pushing her forehead against it to get the the fruits off sometimes they push the whole tree uh, to get the fruits but a lot of times they'll just hit their heads and then collect all right we are gonna head back over to James who is still out on a bushwalk he's seen amazing things this morning and we'll see what else he has in store for us we've got a hyena and it's heading towards Shadow's Kill. We've left the kill site because she didn't come out of the thicket where she was. There is a vehicle in there now, but I think this hyena has smelt something. And as we know, Shadow, a very poor hoister of kills. And it's running the other way now. It's gone the wrong way in the wind. That's good. I'm not sad about that. We don't want the hyena anywhere near Shadow and Cub. The wind's blowing from there to there, and that means that as the hyena came around here, it would have lost the scent. So probably, in fact, it had very slight scent of the blood, and possibly very difficult to pick up the direction of the wind blowing like it was. Let's follow the hyena. I'll show you where the vehicle is. We haven't managed to, we did not get another view of the leopard. She went down into a little thicket and stayed there. But I'll show you how close we are. There's the vehicle. And I don't think they can see her even. I think they're looking down into a thicket. So we got the best view. And then the hyena, you got it again, Rex. Let's go to the termite mound over here. You can hear the birds' alarm calling. Preeti, you want to know on a bushwalk how far we're supposed to be from the animals? Well, I mean, ideally, like I said with the elephants earlier this morning, you want to be able to view them without them being affected by your presence. Now, clearly that's not what happened with Shadow. We disturbed her on the kill. She heard us before we got there. She moved off. And then when we waited around the kill, <coughs> she growled, revealed herself because she thought we were a bit close. We were probably about... 12 meters or so from her when she moved then we got a view and we moved off so from a you know if you're tracking a cat that's often what happens you know you can stand on them before you realize that you found them that's too close ideally there is I mean there's no way of saying you know X number of meters is how close you want to be it's as close as you can be without affecting the animals behavior so if she hadn't moved off the kill we'd have backed off until we could still see her and she was prepared to carry on feeding it's very unusual that that happens with a cat though unless it's a lion and you can you know watch them from some distance but even then they will look at you they'll always keep watching Leopard. Sorry, one second. I'm just trying to figure out what Rex is saying here. Did you see her? Crow. Oh, there was a crow trying to get at the kill. <laughs> Nasty crow. So I'm sure that she will, she, I mean, she'll definitely return to the kill and feed on it. And she'll be absolutely fine. I'm just going to have a look from here. At this distance, she wouldn't react to us at all. Let's just get onto this termite mound here. What a very exciting morning we have had. Elephants and lizards. And of course you've had cheetahs and lions. And we will try and get Noel down here before the end of the drive. We've still got quite a long time. Oops. <laughs> I'm not sure if you saw me leap there, but a, a quail jumped out of the grass. And it just shows that my, um, my senses are obviously quite on edge after that growl from Shadow. I don't see a hyena, and nor do I see the leopard. But that's good, the hyena has gone off.
Um, the centers, you want to know how strong uh, a hyena's ears and nose are. I always forget the numbers exactly, but I think that their sense of smell... I seem to remember a figure of something like 48 times what ours is. So it's 48 times stronger than our sense of smell. I imagine their ears are probably... Oh, we've got pretty sensitive ears. I'd say their ears are probably two or three times more sensitive than our ears are. But uh, the sense of smell is truly phenomenal. And we think possibly the most powerful of uh, just about any, certainly any land mammal. Marvellous. Okay, let's go back across to East Africa now. I got something uh, that sounded like Scott has got something with lots of ears. And as far as I'm aware, most things only have two ears. Hello everyone, and is this not a beautiful sight? Don't forget, there's also a black-backed jackal taking a close look at the cheetah, just like us, also enjoying the view. Your timing could not have been any better. We've literally just arrived. We've been here a minute and they've immediately decided to get up and take us on a stroll. Now who knows how far the cheetah will stroll for, but certainly looking forward to the prospects of them being on the move. It's always wonderful to get to see what they get up to possibly some scent marking, possibly they'll be looking for a meal. They are due a meal. It's approaching 48 hours since they last fed and usually on average I've noticed they like to feed every 24 to 36 hours so they will be getting a little bit hungry. Who knows how many possible attempted hunts they may have had this morning already. It'll be interesting to chat with some of the other people who are enjoying the sighting with us and try and work out what exactly they have been up to. Now, if they continue the way they're going, we are going to have to loop ahead of them and cross a riverbed that they will easily be able to cross, but we certainly won't. Let's just give it some time to work out where they're going. This is not your everyday scene for any of you who may be joining us for the first time. To have five male cheetah together is a spectacle to behold. And even though it has been recorded quite widely throughout Africa, it's not something that happens very often. You'll notice one of them has a collar on his neck. He's D'Artagnan. And he was collared in February or March this year by researchers to try and keep track of them and work out what they get up to and where they've been moving. Thankfully, for the last few weeks, they appear to have kind of found this area and the surrounding valleys as their home. They're not moving as far and wide as they used to when we first arrived here four months ago. They'd be very tricky to keep track of and find, whereas now it's getting a little bit easier, which is certainly wonderful because hopefully that means we'll be able to keep a closer eye on them and share with all of you guys what they get up to. One thing that I'm hoping to see before I leave here, and today is my second to last day across the side of the river, so the clock is ticking before I head back to South Africa. And one thing I'm really hoping for is that they interact with another cheetah, be it male or female. I'd prefer female. I would prefer a love story as opposed to an adventure film because it would be a adventure possibly a thriller if they came across another male or two there are rumors that they have already killed a male but it's not necessarily the case hi dosentos you would like to know why do cheetah scent mark is it not kind of giving away their position to other predators and therefore 
allowing them to more easily kill them. I kind of, I see where you're coming from, DeSantos, but if you think of it in the, in the sense that they do need to communicate with their own species, otherwise they won't be able to have the necessary relationships and therefore procreate. And I don't think, you know, it's going to increase their likelihood of being killed by a lion simply if a lion smells where they've peed on a bush. What's more important is wherever they are, in the flesh and in the present, that they are keeping a very, very close eye around. And as you can see, they're stopping, scanning. It's a very open area. So I don't think leaving notes behind is going to increase the chance of the lions killing you. Because the lions will be looking for those opportunities, just like the cheetah will be looking to avoid them. And it's the same for, you know, all the other prey animals. They also often mark their territories and it doesn't increase their likelihood of being killed by other predators. Hello, Tony. You'd like to know if these guys have any kind of further idea of who's the boss of this hierarchy. Have they managed to settle their differences and accept a leader? Not that I'm aware of and not that I don't think anyone is aware of. The only major thing that we've noticed is D'Artagnan seems to be kind of the fatherly figure. He often does the chokehold, as you know, and he often chases the vultures away. So he kind of does a lot of the hard work, not necessarily all the hunting, but a lot of the hard work once the prey has been brought down, possibly by one of his partners. But in terms of who's the biggest and the strongest, that's very difficult to say at this stage, and I don't even think they know, to be honest. Okay, I think now is going to be a good time to reposition. It is going to take us a couple of minutes. Because I've got a s feeling that they are going to, rather than reversing, it's best to go forward. Otherwise you'll end up like Taylor and crash into someone. <laughs> Shame. It's going to happen to all of us out here. There's often so much going on, so much excitement, and often many vehicles. And we can't see through the back of our vehicle very clearly from the driver's position. Oh, I hope they don't decide to lie down. I don't think they're going to though, so let's head across onto the other side of this little riverbed. See that we with the musketeers and they're on the move. Like I said a bit earlier, I've only got two more days across this side of the river and then it'll be three or four months before I'm back here with them so looking forward to spending as much time in the next two days with them be an interesting statistic to work out how many hours I've spent with them in total because we've done quite a few all-nighters with them 24-hour sessions Whew. we have spent some quality time with them and it's been an absolute privilege to be able to have you guys along for the ride most of the way. Alrighty, nearly there. Provided they keep coming. <laughs> if they don't, we may have a big bush between us and them. still can't see them but we should hopefully get lucky shortly it seems like this guy might know something that we don't he's just repositioned his vehicle so let's see what happens here 
So you'll notice the vehicles on the other side of that belt of croton bushes ahead of us. They were heading kind of towards the back left vehicles, the back two vehicles. And by the way the vehicles are moving now, I'm guessing that hopefully they are continuing towards us through these. Here they come! Awesome! And it looks like they're playing with one another. Keep it up, boys. They often like running through thickets because they can be scared, the ones on the left. And as you can see, still a little bit of rough and tumble. You only caught the end of that. Oh, let's see what happens here. And they're still testing one another, still trying to work out who's who. I mean, either that or it's just playful. Maybe they just enjoy, enjoy doing that. Often if you think of domestic dogs playing with one another, sometimes you, would, you could think that they're actually fighting, but they're not. They're having a good time, and I guess maybe this is no different. Now, a general trend with these boys is that they usually go to sleep by around 8 or 9 in the morning. That doesn't seem to be the case today, which is boding well for us. And they usually get active kind of at 5 or 6 in the evening, and then often move into the early hours of the night till around 10 or 11 before they go to sleep. So they do move quite a lot after dark compared to the female cheetah we've noticed. But from time to time we do get lucky, and they do perform midday massacres. Two days ago, they killed a wildebeest midday, a couple of weeks back we managed to see them catch and kill a big male coax hartebeest again during the middle of the day. So we could be lucky with the same treatment today. They are looking very focused and certainly could do with the meal. What's good to see is that none of them are really limping. They went through a stage where they were all a bit battered and bruised, and we weren't sure, ex well maybe that one on the, at the back there's got a bit of a limp. On that front left leg, he seems to be nursing it a little bit. But, they do seem to have recovered from whatever battered and bruised them about two weeks ago. It could well have been an internal dispute. Beautiful. Alrighty, well I think we're gonna keep looping ahead just to make sure that we know if there is any prey that they're moving towards and then we can position the vehicle accordingly. Shame, I can't stop thinking about that zebra we saw earlier with half of its bottom missing. And also how it happened. Because there were those scars on the right hand side of its tail that were... I couldn't tell if they were fresh, but it was definitely from an attack. Maybe he's just a zebra with nine lives. Because that was a serious injury it sustained from, I'm guessing, lion, maybe crocodile. Oh, we're going to have so. Okay, we need to rush you off to another spotted cat. All right, so we have Shadow, who Rexon and James found for us. I just want to be quiet just for a moment because she's calling the cub. Can we hear that? Right. 
I'm not sure if any of you could hear that, but maybe we can see when she's moving her mouth. She's doing, look, a lion goes, ooh, ooh. But this is a more guttural sound. The Impala have heard her. The Impala are alarm calling um, and are busy, busy figuring out that this, this leopard is here. Just before we got back, uh, you got back to us, she covered up around where the kill is to keep the scent of the, what I'm assuming is an Impala, the dead Impala, um, from permeating so that um, she can now rest comfortably. I th actually thought for a while she was going to go off and fetch her cub, but if she's calling from here, there's a chance that the cub is close by. And now that I'm hearing those Impala go more and more, I have a feeling that maybe rather than um, it being because of shadow, it is probably because of her youngster. So we're going to hang tight here and see what happens. Can we hear the Impala in the background? Not quite sure if you guys are picking that up or not. From my experience, if the cub was a little bit farther away from here, that, that uh, contact call that she was making, she would make it and keep walking. Um, but she's made it several times and now she's lying down. She could also just be tired from making her kill. The Impala are still going in the background. You can see she's breathing quite heavily. She's obviously tired from the stalk, the hunt, the kill, a little bit of eating, and then pushing up all of the debris around the Impala itself. So from the angle where we're sitting, uh, the kill is a little bit difficult to see. I'm actually thinking what we might do is just reverse and come around. She's also facing the other way. Will also give us a chance just to scope around and see if her little one is on the way. So I think let's do that so long. Crowdcat Mama, you're asking if Shadow will hoist a kill to protect it. Crowdcat Mama, on a day like today, and she's cached it under a bush, um, I think she's going to leave it under that bush for now. I think if anything comes to disturb her, say another leopard or a hyena, she'll put it up and hoist it in a tree then. But for now, I think she's pretty comfortable and pretty happy where she is. But it's all variable. It just depends on on what works for her best. There was, I know that uh, James had a hyena sort of on its way in this general direction. Um, but I'm not seeing it now. I know she's got a little bit of a stick in the way of her face, but we'll be able to see her and then there you can see the kill on the left hand side. So she's actually eaten a bit more than I had thought. So it looks like she's killed much earlier today than I had originally thought, eaten quite a bit. And then she's probably just satiated herself and now she's decided she wants to call her youngster in to give her youngster a chance to eat some food as well. So viewers, this is my first time seeing Shadow. When I was shadowing <laughs> when I was shadowing with Tristan, I um we were tracking her quite a bit. But the morning that you all got to see her with her youngster in the tree on a kill, I was not out and about. I was busy learning the ropes of FC. So the other day was my first time seeing her youngster and today is my very first time 
seen her. She's beautiful. She's a little female. She's absolutely stunning. And she's tired. It's interesting. If her youngster was much younger than what she is now, um, she would have gone sort of directly to fetch her. Because the youngster is 10 months old and it's starting to reach that point where she's getting bigger and can and can start learning to do things on her own, not completely yet, but it's getting, getting to that point, Shadow's not necessarily as apt to want to immediately go to go and get her her youngster. Not that she doesn't care about her, but, but yeah. She's also going to get ready for in the next... Shadow's youngster's 11 months old, I think we decided the other day. 10, 11 months old. So in the next half a year to a year, she's um, going to start going to East... Shadow's going to start going to Eastress again and start mating again and be pregnant again with her new litter. Sorry, Curse, what was the question from Judy? Just one more time for me, please. Judy, you're asking, would the cub ignore the mum calling for a long time? It's a really interesting question. Um, everything's individually based on personality. But look, when mum's calling, the cub's going to know, the youngster's going to know that uh, she has something for her in general. So I don't think that uh, Shadow's Youngster is ignoring. I do think that possibly it's a, she's a little bit farther off than where the call can be heard. That that would be my guess. The Impala have died down. So my second thought on the Youngster maybe making its way here, and that's what the Impala were calling about, was off. My first assumption was correct, um, where it had more to do with Shadow herself. I do know, Judy, that especially when they're a little bit younger than the 10 months, although the 10 months can still be a time uh, that's a little bit trepidatious for, for them, um, if the mum leaves the, the little one somewhere and the little one gets curious and moves around too much, sometimes when the mum comes back and the little one's moved too far, the mum can't find it. And that happens sometimes, but it happens more usually with, with um, cubs that are slightly younger than the one we're dealing with now. She's got a very full belly. Alrighty, so James is still trepping about on his own two feet. So while we sit here and wait for either Shadow to start eating again, or maybe the youngster to come up, or maybe for her to go and fetch the youngster, we will link over to James and see what he has for us. What we have is the old home of a praying mantis, that is the Uthika over there. And the little mantis has escaped from there and is probably somewhere not too far away. But of course they are so very well uh, disguised, not described, that they're almost impossible to see unless they move. Now that, as many of you will know, is called an Uthika. And it's made not so much of silk, but it feels a little bit like a silkworm's cocoon, but it's a little bit sturdier than that. It feels almost like it's made of plastic. And where the mantis has gone, well, that shall remain some sort of a mystery. But they hatch as... what do they hatch as? A mantis doesn't have a larval stage, it has an instar stage, so it's, it hatches as a um, a smaller version of the adult. But then they go into these things and emerge as a fully grown adult at some stage of the life cycle. And I'm not sure exactly when that is. I feel like I should know. Anyway, the reason that we're off-road here is that we thought we'd seen a hornbill's nest. But the hornbill just was resting on one of these trees and then flew off. So that's the second failed hornbill nest attempt I've had today. And then, just down over here... We had a really nice sighting of a black-headed oriole. 
which unfortunately, I think, well, let's just have a look. I think they're nesting as well. They're suddenly being a lot more confiding than they are normally. We'll just have a quick look, see. I'm glad you've seen Shadow finally. Nicely. And you can see, apparently she was a bit growly. Uh, that's because we a, a she's got a cub, B she's got a kill, and C we disturbed her on foot, which would have made her upset. Don't worry, she will calm down. Just in here, the black-headed oriole was. But I'm afraid I think it seems to have absconded. Yeah. The only other thing I can tell you at the moment is that uh, the Inkahuma pride has been found again. They've gone quite a long way away, I'm afraid, uh, on towards Torchwood. OK, we're going to head back towards camp now. While we do that, let's go across to East Africa. Of course, he was a nest robber in his youth. Now he is known as the great cheater man of Africa. Hello, everyone. The musketeers have spotted a pride of lion, thankfully, and they are all stopping and staring very intently at the lions. They don't have too much to worry about because they know where the lions are now, but they're just making sure there are none others, no others around creeping up on them. They are so much faster than lions that as long as they know they're around, they will back themselves fully. Now, we've got quite a few vehicles in this sighting with us, so I'm not going to be able to show you where the lions are, but they're basically, let's just show you roughly, Manu, um, the lions are to our left and just on the other side of these vehicles to our left. A little bit more to the left, I don't know if you, they're behind this other vehicle, but I don't think you'll be able to see them. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what the musketeers decide to do. The lions, now that they know the cheetah have spotted them, because they're both having a bit of a stare down at the moment, they will also know that the cheetah are very quick, and therefore it is going to be probably a waste of their time to chase them. But time will tell. What I think I might do is try, hmm, let me try and reposition to give you an idea of exactly what's going on. Like I said, there are lots of other vehicles here with us, so it's a little bit tricky for positioning the vehicle. But I think if we go right onto the opposite side of them, we might be able to get some two shots of them looking at one another. Yeah, I think this is going to work out quite nicely, provided we get a gap between the cars. There's one minibus which is parked in not the most wise position. Should I go back a bit? Bit more. Okay, Manu spotted an angle, so let him do his business. There you can see what's going on a little bit better now. So there's, we're not sure how many lion are there. We initially just saw one and panicked. Told a few vehicles to get out of the way so that the cheetah could see the lions. And that they did. And isn't this just the most bizarre scene? You'd think they'd be like, oh, you know, lions, turn on their heels and head off in the opposite direction. But rather, they, just, they decide to just stop and size one another up from a distance. I'd love to know what the cheetah are all saying to one another. I think the cheetah are going to probably be more chatty in a scenario like this than the lion. Uh, 
That looks like a young male to me. You can see he's developing a little bit of a mane. But can't really work out where the others are and what the composition of this pride is. Well, it's been an incredible morning. You've seen leopards, lions with tailor, cheetah, a female cheetah hunting. Now, lion and cheetah in the same shot. How cool is this? And what's fascinating is it appears that the cheetah are almost taunting the lion, moving closer towards them as opposed to in the opposite direction. Maybe these cheetah want to show off their incredible speed. I've had one cool sighting of, with, of these guys with the lioness that got quite close to them before they realized she was there and she chased them. It was an epic, epic chase. Sadly, we were in an area, I think, with no signal, so you guys didn't see it, so you may have seen a glimpse of it. But then they continued to just kind of like trot around this lioness, almost teasing her, not concerned, almost letting her get close to them because they knew that she had no chance of catching them. Appears like one of the rocket scientists who was driving the one minibus has opened up our view a bit more so we might be able to see some more of the lionesses Manu. The one minibus has moved so we can look further to the right now. Where I think there were some other lions, no. I thought there were some in there. Okay. Well, it's, the cheetah just continued to creep closer, which is really just, it doesn't make sense, unless of course they are teasing them in trying to induce these lions into a bit of a chase. Hello and welcome to everybody who has just joined us on Facebook. We are coming to you live from the Masai Mara in Kenya. As you saw there, there's a young male lion snoozing in those bushes. And these five male cheetahs have just stumbled up upon him. Look at all their tails flicking from side to side. How cool is this? What a scene. Now, cheetah are no match for lion. Not even five cheetah against one male lion would be a match. The lions are simply far too big and strong. But cheetah are super speedy. So these cheetah have actually been moving slightly closer towards the lions since they've spotted them. There are a few more lion we think hidden in those bushes. We just can't work out where. And what's interesting is it appears like the cheetah are almost trying to tempt the lions into chasing them so that they can show them how fuss they are and make them realize that there's no match for a lion and a cheetah when it comes to a foot race. So now that the cheetah know that the lion is here, of course cheetah could be ambushed by lions and if the lions do get a hold of a cheetah it will definitely be a bad ending because the cheetah are so much more frail. Ooh. They've got a little bit of a fright there. Have they spotted more lions or have they just decided it's time to get out of here? How interesting is this? What awesome, awesome scenes. Having slunk up closer and closer to these lions, now they've decided that it's time to rather actually move off. Just like that. For no evident reason to us. They obviously just thought, okay, enough's enough, let's us just slink off here. But I mean, they must know that the lions were looking straight at them. So why are they sneaking away like this? What difference does that make? 
certainly does make for some beautiful scenes, though. Even though I don't quite understand why. They're acting as if they haven't been seen, because surely they must know that those lions were looking directly into them. You can tell when somebody has locked eyes with you, even from a distance. This is so, so cool. It's going to be interesting to see their change of kind of movement, their change of trajectory, because they've been heading generally north and kind of west, whereas now they are heading kind of straight east. Magic, well they're about to disappear out of our view, so we're going to reposition. We are not going to be leaving these guys until the sun goes down, but for you, you will be heading across to Noel with the leopard. What a great interaction with Cheetah and Lion, although it ended abruptly and without, thank goodness, injury to either, but maybe not thank goodness as an interaction between two predator species is incredible. So on to our third big cat. Um, we have Shadow still. She's sleepy. She's super full. She every now and then lifts her head. Every now and then opens an eye. Every now and then smells the wind. But she's definitely found her spot for the day. No sign of the youngster. I do think she's going to take her time and rest and then possibly go and fetch. She was calling earlier. The youngster's a little bit far, too far away to hear her. But that's okay. It is normal for a leopard or a lion to leave their youngsters for two, three, four, sometimes five days at a time. Although five days is pushing it a bit. Um, and remember that Shadow's youngster is old enough to catch things like baby mice on her own and things like that. So she is not going to be starving by any means. And every mum needs a break. And every mum needs to sometimes just have a meal on their own. That is for sure. So... <clears throat> We've had quite quite the morning. Our wild dog tracks didn't come out. We couldn't find, at least find where they came out. We we're so lucky that James ended up finding Shadow. So we get to spend um, our last little bit of time with her. We will most likely come back here this afternoon. Um, and Scott is out in the Mara and Taylor's out in the Mara. So I'm hoping we get some good cat action. I think this evening let's try and do as much cat activity as we possibly can. Of course, Murphy is a little bit evil, and you never know what he has in store for us. But she should still be here as long as no one steals her kill. Um, and so for us, we'll be coming back this side. Thank you so much from myself, Jandre, Scott, Taylor, James, the film crews, FC. You must have an incredible day and join us this afternoon. <laughs>